There we go. Well, good morning. Um, I'm Pastor Jay Beckley from Stone Creek Bible Church here in Temecula, California, and we're just so excited to spend some time in the Word of God together and just in the middle of God's creation. You know, there's horses over here behind us kicking up dust, and there's roosters over there commenting on my sermon, and uh, we're just going to just do church like Jesus did church. Luke chapter 12. This is a powerful chapter. If you have not been with us for the last couple of weeks, I would encourage you to just to spend some time and read through chapter 12 a few times. <laughs> because, uh, yeah, that's going to be, yeah, wild, huh? I'm actually going to, yeah, there we go. Now I'm not in the sun anymore. I'll preach to these people over here instead of these people over here. That's great. So anyway, Luke chapter 12. Um, it's actually a very well-planned chapter. Luke is teaching some amazing things. You know, he starts by reminding the disciples um, not to be discouraged by the Pharisees, the hypocrites, the, the, the conservative religious people who had made religion into something that was very different from faith in God. And so in that first part of chapter 12, Luke addresses this problem that many of us have when, we, when our leaders disappoint us or they make decisions that we don't agree with or we don't understand. Why in the world would they go in that direction? And so Jesus uses some, some visuals, some object lessons that are easy to remember. He says that this hypocrisy among the, the religious leaders of Jesus' day is like the yeast that you put in bread. <laughs> it, it puffs it up, and it makes it look bigger than it really is. And uh, yeah, it's soft and fluffy, and it tastes really good, but uh, you know the yeast doesn't really make it much different. And uh, that's the way sometimes religious people are. They want to be concerned about the way they look on the outside, but they're not really dealing with what they need to deal with on the inside. And so Jesus' point was, Hey, if you're struggling with hypocrisy in your experience of life, then you need to connect with me. You need to connect with Jesus. And, and he says in that passage, you know, man, you need to acknowledge Christ and I will acknowledge you before God. And I will send the Holy Spirit into your life and give you help living your daily life. Great part, part one for that chapter. The second part, Jesus does the same thing, like a master teacher. Oh my goodness. The second part, he tells this story of the rich fool, this wealthy old guy who, who decides that he's going to tear down his barns and build new barns, and he's going to hoard all the blessings that God has given him. <laughs> and Jesus says, hey, buddy, <laughs> you're foolish, because tonight, you know, before you build your barns, before you do your plan, your soul is going to be required of you. And so then whose will these things be, you know? And so Jesus is kind of teaching his disciples. It's like we tend to get carried away with how much stuff we can accumulate and how successful we can be and how rich we can become and how we can prepare for our retirement. And, you know, we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And Jesus says, hey, if your strategy in life doesn't survive your sudden unexpected death, then it's a foolish strategy. And then Jesus wraps that teaching segment up with the instruction, hey, you need to be sending treasure on to heaven. <laughs> you need to be investing your life in people. You need to be winning people to Christ. You need to be investing in people who have needs that you can actually be, you know, a reflection of God's character and love for them. And so you can partner with God in doing ministry. And so that was his second point of training for his disciples. Now, today we get into this third point in verse 35 of chapter 12. And I want to read down through um, this passage. Verse 35. I'll read all the way to 48. So, verse 35. Jesus says, Stay dressed for action. <laughs> and in some Bibles, it actually says, Gird up your loins which is a weird, strange way of saying, you know, get dressed for work. Oh, my goodness. Actually, I'm going to talk about that after I'm done reading. 
because it's, it's really cool. And number two, keep your lamps burning. And number three, be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. Blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at a table and he will come and serve them. <laughs> Whoa. So this is the story of the third point. It's like, be like servants who work for a master who treats you with dignity and respect and rewards you for your, your, your commitment and your dedication. Be like that kind of servant. Now then, verse 38. If he comes in the second watch or in the third watch and finds them awake, blessed are those servants. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. You also must be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour that you do not expect. In verse 41, Peter asks them, he says, Lord, are you telling this parable for us or for everybody? And then the Lord said this, Who then is the faithful and wise manager, whom his master will set over his household to give them their portion of food at the proper time? Blessed is that servant whom his master will find so doing when he comes. Truly, verse 44, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions. But if that servant says to himself, my master is delayed in coming and begins to beat the male and female servants. So this is oppression or just, yeah, taking advantage of the other people. And so to eat and drink and get drunk. <laughs> the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour that he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him up with the unfaithful. Oh, there's a severe judgment. You know, and we'll come back to that. And that servant who knew his master's will but did not get ready or act according to his will will receive a severe beating. But the one who did not know and did not or and did what deserved a beating, will receive a light beating. And everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. And from him to whom they entrusted much, they will demand even more. Oh my goodness. So this is a great passage. And it actually has several layers to it. There's a layer on top that is kind of like, what do we do with this wisdom and how does it change the way we affect our daily lives? Then another layer, which is kind of reflected by Peter's question. Hey, Lord, are you talking to everybody or are you talking to us? You know, your disciples, people that you've chosen to put into responsible positions and leadership and ministry. And so there's a layer of, that kind of applies to leaders. <laughs> it's about a higher level of accountability. <laughs> but then there's also another layer that deals with our, the, way we, the way we trust God. And when Jesus says in that, the end of that first section, you know, the Son of Man will come when you don't expect Him. Well, that term, Son of Man, is from Daniel chapter 7. And it's a prophecy about the Messiah that will, that will come fulfilling God's promises. And He will organize the kingdoms of the world and He will rule with righteous and justice. And so if you go back and read Daniel 7, it talks about Son of Man... And that's where this term for Messiah comes from. And so there's a layer of this passage that kind of deals with the coming or Jesus coming, his second coming, and the promises that God gives us to look forward to in that event. So there's those three layers to look at. So if we look at this passage just again, just one more time, I'll scan through it. Jesus says, hey, if you want to be ready... <laughs> For the, for the master to come back from the wedding feast. So this is kind of a story with a practical application that we, can, that we can relate to in our daily lives. He says, number one, dress for action. And, and the word there is gird up your loins. And in the first century, guys that lived in Jerusalem or the areas where Jesus was teaching, they mostly wore robes that went down you know, to their lower, um, their lower calves or almost their ankles. 
and those robes were comfortable and you know they were uh, cool let's say <laughs> on a hot day in the in the Middle East if you were relaxing around home or or just hanging out with your friends but if you needed to do work or you needed to run or you wanted to do something quickly you had to you, you did something that was common in that day it's called girding your loins and if you spent much time wearing robes you you probably can figure this out what they would do is they would take their they would they would reach their hand under their between their legs and they would find the front part of their robe and they would pull it up inside to their back area and stick it up into their belt and then they would reach down through their legs and they would get their the back part of their robe and they would pull the back part of their robe up and then stick it into their belt on the front and so when you looked at them it looked like they were wearing shorts at that point instead of a robe you know they had the same top on but their legs were all wrapped up and their thighs were covered their their loins were girded and then they would tighten their belt and this little outfit would allow them to do several different things they could run really quickly to go somewhere and get someplace they could work really hard and not worry about catching their robe on a thorn or a splinter or a fence or you know and having their to clothes torn off and they could also fight with their loins girded then he says light your lamps now that's obviously kind of a a metaphor you know we wouldn't use lamps today we'd use flashlights or our phones or something else if we were out in a dark place and we needed to see what we were doing or if somebody came to our house we'd flick on the the porch light so that they could see the door as they come up and then we could greet them if they were coming to our house at night but the the illustration or the the meaning behind that is you need to keep your lamps lit so that other people know that you're ready to receive them and so that you can see them coming and so keeping your lamp lit is like a reference to situational awareness it means that as believers we're paying attention to our culture and to the the community that we live in and to the challenges that people are facing and so we're aware of what is going on and we can we can be prepared to deal with the circumstances we need to deal with then the third thing he says is you need to have an attitude like a servant who works for a guy who comes home from a trip, puts on his apron, and cooks a meal for you. <laughs> you know, that's the kind of guy I want to work for. I want to work for a guy, and, and I'm watching his home and taking care of his stuff while he's off at a party. But then when he comes home, he gives me a chance to relax and to recover, and he actually blesses me. That's the kind of guy I want to work for. But as Jesus is teaching... He adds a couple of things to this little story about how we should how we should live our life like servants that work for a really great master and he adds a couple things here that kind of change the kind of change the the way we respond emotionally he says because if you don't greet your your if you don't greet the guy he's not going to be happy with you if you're not ready, it's not going to work. You know, and then he makes that closing statement about that's the way Messiah is going to come. Messiah is going to come at a time when you don't expect him. And so all of a sudden, as Christians, we're reading through this and we're thinking, oh my goodness, Jesus is teaching us something about being ready for the Messiah. It's part of this thing. And where does that come from? I mean, we were doing pretty good, you know, uh, stay ready, keep your lamp lit. You know, be like a servant who works for a really great guy, which means you, you, you're happy about your work and you feel fulfilled and you feel appreciated and you feel uh, acknowledged and recognized. And so where does this Messiah stuff come in? Well, Jesus is a master teacher and Luke is a master teacher as well. And as he tells the story that Jesus is communicating, he gives us these details and then he he sticks this little thing in where Peter says well Lord is is this for us or is this for everybody <laughs> you know are you are you giving us some special insight here or is this just general stuff everybody's supposed to respond to now 
I don't have any idea why Luke chose to stick Peter into this story. <laughs> Except for the fact that Peter was the one who was always saying, you know, Jesus, I'm going to love you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to fight for you. You know, and then, and then Jesus had to say, Peter, <laughs> you know, you're going to deny me before the cock crows three times. You know, you're, you're not quite ready to make that commitment yet. And Luke writes his gospel after the resurrection. And so he's not really telling us something that Jesus wanted his disciples to know in their life before the crucifixion and resurrection. You know, he, Luke writes his gospel probably about 20 years after the resurrection. And so he's writing to people that experienced the resurrection. They came to know Christ as their Savior. And now they're wondering, how long is it going to be before he comes back? You know, in John, the last chapter, no, Acts chapter 1, we're told the, the story of Jesus' ascension into heaven. And then as soon as he goes up in the clouds, there's two guys standing there who are dressed in white, which probably means they're angels. We don't know. We're not told. But they're dressed in white. And they say to the disciples, you know, Jesus is going to come back the same way you just saw him take off. In other words, he's going to come back in the clouds. He's going to come back to the Mount of Olives. And when he comes back, everything on earth is going to change <laughs> because he's coming back to claim his kingdom. And so Jesus is inviting us as we think about these things to put it in that perspective, the perspective of Christians who are waiting for Jesus to come, wondering how long it's going to take him. You know, and one of the things that I think we experience as Christians is some of the things that Luke has talked about. We get frustrated when, when, when the leaders, the people that we should trust, are hypocrites. When their lives don't actually match the sermon that they preach when they're on TV. You know, and... We also get distracted by the stuff that we try and collect, <laughs> the lives that we try and organize, the strategies and plans that we try and put in place, even though God may not really be too concerned about those things. And so we wonder, what in the world? And now this story about servants waiting for the master to come home in that second part, when Jesus responds to Peter's question, you notice he, he raises the level from just general things about being a servant. Then he talks about the servant who's put in charge, the manager, or the Bible says steward. And so he gets frustrated waiting for the master to come home. And so he starts taking advantage of the other servants. He starts beating the male and the female servants. He starts expecting them to, you know, give him a bigger ration of food and drink. And so he's actually out there taking advantage of people so that he can have a little party and get himself drunk. And so the story changes. And what is Jesus trying to do there? Well, I think he's trying to get us to understand that there are two ways to respond. To life. One is to acknowledge Christ and to trust God, to, to keep his promises and to, to be a part of our life. If we can't trust Christ and can't put our faith in God to, re, to come back and, and, and to bring the Messiah the way he said, then what are we going to do? We're going to take advantage of other people. We're going to have a party for ourselves, even if that means, you know, oppressing other people beating up the servants that don't want to allow us to have a party. <laughs> like, what in the world? You know, this is, a this, is, this is kind of a cultural discussion that goes all the way back to the first century. And yet it's kind of like what we experience today in different ways. And so what is Jesus saying? He's saying, hey, if you choose not to be the way I've asked you to be, ready, situationally aware, like with a lamp lit, and acting as a servant who works for a great boss, if you want to not do those things, then you're going to be subject to judgment. When the, when the master comes back and you're not ready and your not, lamps are not lit and you're not happy about what you're doing, you've been taking advantage of other people, what's going to happen? <laughs> you're going to be judged. Now the passage says cut in pieces. At least in my Bible, in the, in the English Standard Version, it says cut in pieces. But I think the translation for that is, is more like 
um, whipped in pieces, like scourged, where the leather um, whips would cut your back in pieces maybe, because the, this servant doesn't die, he's being punished, he's being beaten, he's being isolated from his other servants, he's being sent to be with the people that are unfaithful. And then Jesus brings this issue of judgment under a little microscope, and he says, you know what? The judgment of God isn't just black and white. It's just not, you know, good guys and bad guys. The judgment of God isn't like good people are going to heaven and bad people are going to hell. No. The judgment of God is very specific. And Jesus zooms in on that issue. He says, hey, the, the servants that don't serve, but they understand exactly what the master wants them to do and they decide not to do it, they're going to have a huge judgment. The servants that don't understand what the master's expectation are, so maybe these are servants that work under a bad manager, they don't really understand what the expect expectations are, but they do the wrong things anyway. They're going to be punished, but they're not going to be punished as bad as the manager who knows what God expects and doesn't do it. What, what is Jesus saying? He's saying two things. He's saying, one, if you're not doing what God wants you to do, your judgment is going to be specific to your understanding and your resources. That's what he draws, that's what he draws into in the passage. He says, hey, these guys, they're going to be judged based on what they know, and they're going to be judged based on what their resources are, and their judgment is going to be different. Now, the implication of that is that Jesus is telling the disciples that God's judgment is based on the fact that he knows what you know. <laughs> he knows exactly what you know when you make choices to obey or not obey. He knows whether you really understand God's instruction. He knows if you really understand the implications of your decisions. He knows if you really understand the consequences of your decisions and how those decisions are going to impact other people. God knows. And God knows what resources you have. God knows exactly how much is in your bank account when you drive by that poor guy who's got his hands out because he wants five bucks to get lunch. God knows what kind of resources he has given you when you refuse to go help somebody who's needy or who's not as comfortable as you are. God knows. And his judgment is going to be based on this knowledge. And so Jesus, again, for this in this third thing, you know, the hypocrite Pharisees, the rich fool who's, who's hoarding all of his stuff, and the servant who's not serving as if his master was worthy. In, these th in all three of these things, Jesus is also teaching theology. Remember the discussion of the, Phar the Pharisee, the, hypoc the hypocrite Pharisee? He says, well, you know, uh, two sparrows are sold for a farthing, and are, aren't you more valuable than two sparrows? In other words, Jesus is wanting us to look out in the trees and see those little small birds out there and realize that when one of those birds falls to the ground, God knows about it. So he's teaching about the theology of God's omniscience, the fact of, that God knows everything, and that his decisions and his judgments and his directions in our life are based on the fact that he knows everything. He knows what we know. He knows what the resources we have are. He knows what our challenges are. He knows what the difficulties are going to be. And he knows before, we, before it even happens what the results of our decisions and our actions are going to be. And so we got to figure out how we're going to respond to that. You know, do we think that we can hide what we're thinking or our true intentions from God when we make a decision? <laughs> yeah, no, that's not going to happen. Because God knows what's in our hearts. You know, can we, can we just dedicate our lives to accumulating as much stuff as we need? <laughs> well, that's not going to work because when we go stand before God in eternity, we're going to have nothing if we haven't sent treasure ahead. And the way we send treasure ahead is by obeying God's direction in our life and following his instructions and obeying his word. And then this last passage is about, is about anticipating his coming <laughs> and being ready, <laughs> And so what does that mean? Well, it means as Christians, on the top layer, we should be ready for anything. We should be ready to run. We should be ready to work. We should be ready to fight. Gird up the loins. In other words, 
Whatever comes at us, whether it's blessing or persecution, as Christians, we should be ready for that. And then we should have our lamps lit. In other words, we need to be looking around. We need to be paying attention to what God is doing in other people's lives and, and how we can help God in, 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 in extending ministry, in sharing the gospel, in telling people what we believe about Jesus. You know, that's what we should be doing. And if we don't want to do those things, then <laughs> there's going to be a time when we're going to have to face the music. <laughs> now, the good thing about this passage is that I don't believe that Jesus and Luke are saying, hey, if you're a Christian, you better watch out because God's going to punish you. No. Romans chapter 8, verse 1 says that there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. As Christians, we don't get punished, but we miss the opportunity to be blessed as a result of our obedience. This passage isn't saying that if Christians don't behave properly, that their eternal security is in jeopardy. No. But Jesus is saying very clearly, the way we live is a reflection of our faith. And if we're not living a faithful life, if we're not living a life that's obedient to the, to the Word of God and to Jesus' instruction, then we should probably be questioning our relationship with Christ. We should be asking, Lord, like, is there something I need to do? Why am I missing out? And how can I get back on track? You know, that's a basic teaching of Scripture. And so this passage is literally kind of inviting people to evaluate our lives and to realize that, yeah, we may be disappointed because our leaders have, have disappointed us. The Pharisees and the chief priests that they worked with in Jesus' day were the religious leaders. They got up in front of people and they said, hey, bring your offerings to the temple and do what we tell you to do and, we'll be, and you'll be okay with God. You know, and then they killed the Son of God. <laughs> which tells us that, no, they weren't on the right track. Following those people isn't how, we, isn't how we impress God. And then, you know, the challenge of accumulating stuff. How do we change our focus from materialism and measuring our life by how much stuff we get to a kind of a, a life of faith in God, measuring our life by how willing we are to follow God's direction? That's important. And so I love the reassurances that come from this passage. And it just affects so many of the things in my life. Can I handle disappointment after studying this passage? Oh, yeah. When my spiritual leaders disappoint me and I find out that they're human and they make mistakes and they do stupid things, does that discourage me? No, because my faith isn't in my religious leaders. My faith is in Jesus. And the message that I'm sharing with people is that we can trust Jesus, even when our religious leaders disappoint us, even when our friends disappoint us, even when people we love disappoint us, we can still trust Jesus. And it's his plan and his purpose that we are, gonna, that we are designed to experience in our own lives. And so I love the way Jesus teaches his disciples, preparing them to face some of the very same challenges that we will face. 